everyone! Welcome back to Melody Ever After. I'm here today to answer a very important question. Is it just me or is D&D cool again? This is my dungeon. These are my source books. This is my dice tower. This is my gelatinous cube. These are my D&D ring magic item replicas. Seems like in today's day and age, D&D is a totally normal hobby, and Dungeons and Dragons isn't just for mouth breathers anymore. It's for cool people like me. Don't, don't pan to us. Dungeons and Dragons has a huge history of waning in and out of popularity, and despite it being immortalized as that weird game from the 80s, I'd say that it's more popular now than it ever has been. Throw a rock into a college campus and you'll hit someone who has played or plays D&D, right before you get escorted off the campus by the police for assault. But it hasn't always been this way. In fact, I don't even remember anybody playing D&D during my childhood. Remember when people liked to skateboard? Do a burn on them! Do a slappy! Do a drop in! Do a soul grind! Do a kickflip! All right, nice ollie. I thought it was Tony Hawk. Very kickflip! Seriously, D&D is like everywhere. The Dungeons and Dragons movie, Critical Role, Dimension 20, Vox Machina, on TV, on podcasts, YouTube, in books, in media, it pops up all the time. Even celebrities have been known to play D&D. &D. Magic Mike's Joe Manganiello is a DM for Paul Wright, James Gunn, and Vince Vaughn and more. Terry Crews, Matthew Lillard, Vin Diesel, and The Rock have all admit to playing D&D &D and enjoying it. And I just feel like that wasn't something that was talked about in media or in the tabloids as of like five, ten years ago. Am I crazy? It just baffles me that in the 2000s it seems like Dungeons and Dragons was what was considered a mouth breather activity, but now everyone and their dog plays it. Which begs the question, what happened? I did a ton of research and I was honestly looking for answers for myself more than anything, but I decided why not make a little video about it since I make little videos about everything else anyway. I'm proud to present a not so brief history of why D&D became popular all of the sudden. I started doing research from like the creation of D&D and forward to figure out why it has truly been relevant and irrelevant, waning in and out of pop culture media all the time. And I really think the best way to understand why it's so popular now is to look at all of the reasons it was unpopular before. It's the 80s. There is a dawning of entertainment that only nerds are into. That doesn't mean that non-nerds didn't like these things individually, but things like high fantasy media, sci-fi media, video games, home video games and arcade games, and tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons were a part of this entertainment genre that I'm going to classify as nerd culture. From what I can find, it really seems like arcades were the first place that nerd culture became a subgenre of entertainment. Arcades were fun places for people of all ages, but in large towns they were kind of considered seedy. Arcades were dark, cheap, and loud. Pot smoke and cigarette smoke hung in the air, and it made for the perfect environment to do a quick drug deal or teenage finagling. Arcade games like Sorcerian, Dragon Slayer, and Castlevania propelled high fantasy adventure games we know and love today, but they were all inspired by high fantasy media like Lord of the Rings and later sci-fi media. That's because these entertainment engineers and tech designers were, well, nerds. Aside from a seedy crowd, teens who loved fantasy, sci-fi, and technology flocked to these arcades as a place to experience non-athletic fun and activities. This, coupled with the edgy crowd that frequented arcades, caused a clash of genres of sorts. All right, fine, I'll be a dwarf, but my name is Carlos. <laughs> Carlos the dwarf? Yeah, you got a problem with that, Gorthon? No. Check out the wheels of the 
sci-fi and high fantasy games were being enjoyed by a hodgepodge of kids who were all generally ostracized by popular kids. So when D&D Player's Manual hit the bookshelves in about 1983 and Unearthed Arcana was released in 1985, it was only natural that the arcade kids seen dip their toes into TTRPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. This made parents and teens associate Dungeons and Dragons with kids who were socially inept and kids who were bad influences. This, aside from the fact that Max the Machine McElhaney, number 48 on the football team, and Becky Johansson, the flyer of the cheer squad, didn't exactly like to spend their Saturday nights pretending to be elves slaying dragons. That kind of also added to the uncool factor of Dungeons and Dragons. That's how D&D became well-loved and uncool, but how did it become cool? I think it's time we break down a timeline. We're going on a speed run. In 1974, Gary Gygax released the first version of D&D. It was confusing, but his publisher and editors were able to convince him to revise the game to make it accessible and fun for teens. In the late 70s, entertainment engineers and designers started developing arcade machines with storylines that were rooted in sci-fi and fantasy, inspired by media like Doctor Who, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, Dragon Song, and eventually Star Wars. In the late 70s and 80s, a combination of arcade fever, better special effects in sci-fi and fantasy film, and psychedelic music propelled interest in Dungeons and Dragons. It created an overlap of media from hard rock and kind of stoner kids, as well as the nerdy, unpopular kids. The modern genre of nerd culture was born. It was revived from the ashes of the comic book and spaceman craze of the 1960s. D&D and media like it was heavily enjoyed by social outcasts and non-athletic nerds everywhere, as well as some popular kids individually. Then, in 1979, James Dallas Egbert III, a 16-year-old child prodigy, disappeared from his Michigan State dorm. He was later found in a tunnel system beneath the campus having a psychiatric episode. Despite the fact that he was a child prodigy three to five years younger than the rest of the students on campus struggling socially, mentally, and as well with substance abuse, he was an avid D&D player, and his parents believed the episodes were caused by Dungeons and Dragons. They said that the game caused him to have blurred lines between fantasy and reality. In 1980, James commits suicide, and his parents, as well as other Christian activists, blame Dungeons and Dragons. In 1982, high school student Irving Lee Pulling died after shooting himself in the chest. Despite an article in the Washington Post at the time commented that Pulling had trouble fitting in, and Victoria Rockcharley, a classmate of Irving Pulling, commented that he had problems anyway that weren't associated with the game, they still blame Dungeons and Dragons for his unfortunate death. It's almost like when socially struggling kids are ignored and relentlessly bullied and their needs and wants are continuously put off by their parents and peers, they get depressed. Weird concept. Irving's mother, Patricia Pulling, believed that her son's suicide was caused by him playing D&D. At first, Patricia Pulling attempted to sue the principal because he played a game of D&D that the principal ran, and she insisted that a curse that the principal uh, and DM put on her son's character carried over into real life and caused him to commit suicide. She also sued TSR Incorporated, the publishers of D&D. Despite the court dismissing the cases, Pulling continued to campaign and formed Bothered About D&D, or BAD. Pulling described D&D as a fantasy role-playing game which uses demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex, perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, satanic type rituals, gambling, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divination, and other teachings. What other teachings? What, what else is there? Other teachings. This spread a false narrative to conservative and Christian activists who had never even played the game and encouraged them to ban it as well as even burn copies of their kids' books. Even though at the time, Dungeons & Dragons was almost exclusively inspired by media that baby boomers in the silent generation loved, like Lord of the Rings, because they had never played it and they followed this false narrative, it spread really harmful ideology about 
what happens during a D&D &D game. And I don't really understand how this is supposed to discourage someone from playing D&D, &D, but uh, they even went so far as to create political cartoons that are just kind of weird and campaign material to boycott this game. Which spell did you cast, Debbie? I used the mind bondage spell on my father. He was trying to stop me from playing D&D. &D. The game was eventually misconstrued as demonic. Enter satanic panic mode. <laughs> Satanic Panic continued to influence parents and teens into the late 80s and early 90s. Traditional Christian conservative parents discouraged D&D, and nerdy and rebellious teens played it simply to prove a point. The end result was a demand for more devilish and hellish content in later editions of Dungeons & Dragons. The second edition of the game in 1994 introduced interplanar and interdimensional travel, which introduced hellish landscapes and races like the Tiefling, which according to the lore of the game is a character who is born of demonic lineage or someone who is cursed by a demon. In the late 90s and early 2000s, nerds still played D&D, but they did it quietly. The demonic imagery of the game now proved the conservative Christian right-wing extremist standpoint that D&D had demonic imagery in it and justified the overly involved parents' concerns. I'm gonna go out on a limb and probably just assume that these parents encouraged the bullying or turned a blind eye to when their kids bullied D&D players because now it was a weird thing to like. The lack of D&D attributed suicides, thank God there weren't more, caused a significant reduction of D&D representation in the media. The third edition of Dungeons & Dragons came out in 2003, and while many nerds played it, they did so quietly because nerd culture took a back seat to the flashy, low-rise 2000s nostalgia we know and love today. Small details about the third edition were just bad. This, as well as because 3E was not marketed well, the rules were complex and there was a lot of misogynistic undertones, coupled with the terrible marketing, led to D&D being less relevant in culture. From 2000 to 2013, I'd even go as far to say that D&D was pretty much culturally extinct. I've done a lot of research and I know that there's a lot of Redditors that disagree with me, but let's face it, I hadn't heard about this game and no one I knew had even really talked about it. I mean, my parents hadn't even heard of it since the 80s at this point. I didn't hear about D&D until 2014 and even then it wasn't super popular where I was from. When I was a senior in high school and I told my mom that my then boyfriend and I were we're gonna go over to a friend's house to play Dungeons and Dragons. She kind of raised an eyebrow and looked at me. I was like, Dungeons and Dragons? What? No one has, no one's ever played that since the 90s. What are you doing? Which brings us to the entire reason that D&D is back in fashion. And it all started with the cringiest year of all time. The year was 2014. You've been watching Melody Ever After. Until next time.